All right, guys. Well, as you uh, as we prepare to get into our Bible study tonight, I do want you to watch one more video. We don't need the lights to come down or anything like that, but there is a like, like super cool world explorer type of dude who sent us a video that he wanted us to see tonight. So if you will, turn your attention to the screens and let's look at this globe-trotting world traveler and see where he's hanging out. I'm right here at Caesarea Philippi, and this is a place where Jesus brought his disciples to this place right here, and he asked them the question, who do people say that I am? And they said, some people think you're John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the other prophets, and then Jesus turned the question back on them, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And then Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and at that point, uh, Jesus said, you are no longer called Simon, but you are Peter, Petros, which means rock. He says, and on this rock, this rock solid faith, I'm going to build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So much significance about what Jesus does in this place, in this passage of scripture, um, because he's standing here at this place where you can see that big cave that's right behind me right there. This was regarded by people who were pagan worshipers that worship pagan, fake, non-existent gods. This very hole right here was seen and known as the gates of hell that this was the gateway, this was the gateway to the realm of the dead. And in this, uh, on this rock face that's all around us, this was a pagan temple that was dedicated to the pagan god Pan. And, but there was all kinds of temples, uh, temples and representations of other, uh, uh, of other pagan gods as well. And so Jesus came all the way to this point to ask his disciples that question and say, hey, amongst all these other fake non-existent gods, who do you say that I am? And at that moment, that's when Peter declared that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, you've done well. This has been revealed to you, not by flesh and blood, but by my father who's in heaven. And so as we stand right here at Caesarea Philippi, we stand on this place where people of Jesus' time regarded this as the gateway to hell. This very opening right here is the gateway to hell. And Jesus stood in this very spot to speak the only way that is to real true life, that all of these other non-existent gods are not the way, the truth, and the life, but that only faith in him is the way to true eternal life. Jesus announced his victory over all of these other pagan, fake, non-existent, dead gods. And the Bible tells us too, from that moment, Jesus left this place right here and he steadfastly turned his face toward Jerusalem. So from this moment on, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to where he knew he was going to die on the cross for our sins. He was going to rise victoriously from the grave to win that victory of life over death. Love you guys so much. And I'll talk to you soon. I'll talk to you real soon. All right. Um, hey, let's give it up for our world explorer guy. Quite man. Quite, quite handsome too, if I don't mind saying so myself. Um, hey, yeah, about a month and a half ago, I was standing right there in the spot that we're talking about in Scripture tonight. This is in the city that was known in Bible times as Caesarea Philippi. And I want to read you the passage of Scripture that we're going to talk about here tonight. This comes from Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. And Zach, I know you're running the screen. We're, we're actually going to run out of verses before we get to the end of this because I'm going to read two more. All right, but verse 13 starts out this way. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is God's word. Let's pray together. 
God, we thank you so much for the night that we're able to share tonight just in spirit and truth, in worship, in having a good time, and laughing together. We thank you so much for the story that you've written on Hannah's life and the story that you write on the lives of so many others and anyone who comes to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So God, we pray that you would direct us right now. As we dig into your precious life-giving word, would you show us what it looks like for us to build our lives on the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ? Because it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, well, tonight we're going to start a brand new Bible study series, a series that is called build. And over the series of the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about how to build our lives on the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ. Now, I promise you guys, I didn't intend this. This was not on purpose. Actually, God gave me the theme and name for this series that we were going to talk about over the next couple of weeks. This was the day after D-Now was over. I kid you not. Am I lying, Zach, Lacey? Am I this like happened the next day. <laughs> we finished D-Now on Sunday, and then Monday morning, God started just showing me like, hey, check out all of this stuff that's about building in the Bible. Hmm. And we started jotting things down. So over the stretch of the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about what it looks like to build our lives on Christ. And then God gently showed me as well, hey, one of the major points that we made in D-Now was how to hold on to the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ. Everything else is sinking sand. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. So in D-Now, we learned about who that foundation is and how, how secure that foundation is. And over the stretch of the next five uh, weeks that we're here together in Refuge, we're going to learn what it looks like to build our lives on that solid rock foundation of Jesus. We're going to be looking at, at some building that takes place in the Bible tonight. We're going to be looking at Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Next week, we're going to jump into 1 Peter chapter 2, where it says anybody who's come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are being built into a spiritual house, into something that will never perish, spoil, or fade away. We're going to be talking about that next week. Then we, after that, we're going to get into like Ezra and Nehemiah, when Nehemiah went back home to Jerusalem to re- build the walls around Jerusalem, right? And then God called this guy Noah to go out into the middle of the desert, and God called him to build an ark out in the desert. It had never rained before, and it took him 100 years to build it, and his neighbors are saying, what are you doing building that? But he built it by God's word, at God's direction, and specifically by God's instructions. And then we'll wrap up this series talking about the example that Jesus gave. We studied about this some during D-Now. Jesus portrayed these two houses, these two houses that on surface level looked precisely the same, but one house was built on sinking sand and one house was built on the rock. And he says, you will be wise if you hear my words and believe them and put them into practice. You'll be like a wise builder who built his house on the rock. We've got a series theme verse that I want us to all say out loud together because each night over the next five Wednesdays that we're together, we're going to be focusing on this verse. It comes from Psalm 127 verse 1. I'm not even making you memorize the whole verse. This is just the first half of the verse right here, okay? Psalm 127 verse 1 says this. It says, one, two, three, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Amen. That's going to be kind of the captured focus of what we're going to be talking about over these next few weeks. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. So this, so this, through this series, for myself and Zach and Lacey, our prayer for you guys is that you will, that, that you will allow the master builder <laughs> to build your life into something that gives him glory that is for your good and that points others toward Jesus. Now, does anybody remember where we were last week? Oh, man, you get a check plus and a smiley face. Anybody remember what the message was titled last week? Slight hint, it's the theme of Super Summer this summer. We talked about people who are being sent, right? And we looked in Luke chapter 9. When Jesus sent those disciples out two by two, he sent them out on six two-man teams to go out for their first mission trip in which Jesus was not right there with them. 
And we discovered that those who are sent by Jesus can rely on Jesus' commissioning, his call, because while they're on that trip, they are relying only on Jesus' power and on Jesus' authority so that as you and I are sent out into the world to share the good news of the gospel, we can rely on the fact that Jesus has sent us in his power and in his authority. But when Jesus sent those disciples out, I just can't help but wonder, I wonder what happened next. Anybody got the, like the postscript to that? What happened next? We, last week we saw Jesus sent them out. They were like afraid to go. Like, Jesus, you're wanting us to go without you. Huh? But Jesus sent them out on this trip. As they went out on this trip, they saw God do miraculous things. What happened next? Well, we're going to find out what happened next because that's exactly where the passage of Scripture that we're reading tonight picks up. So open in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to see that when the disciples have returned from their two-by-two two missions, in which God, they've seen God do some miraculous things, Jesus takes them on a long journey. He takes them on a long journey to this really kind of spooky place and he took them all that way just to ask them a couple of questions. All right, let's take a look together. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, says this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? All right, so Jesus had sent these six two-man teams out to places all over this region where they lived. I mean, y'all remember we talked about it some last week is that they started there really the center of operation was the city of Capernaum. And from Capernaum, he sent them out. It's like, you two go this way. You two go this way. You two go across the Sea of Galilee. Go that way. You two go south. You two go over. He's sending these guys in all different directions. You're just covering the whole area there. And as these guys went to all these different places where they showed up, they started talking about Jesus and and when people started talking back to them, they discovered there's a lot of people in all of these places who have different ideas about who Jesus is. They got different ideas about who Jesus is. He, Jesus is, he's asking them, he said, hey, when y'all went on those trips, you like went over to the Decapolis, you went down to Cana, you went over to uh, Perea, you went to all these different places. Who did people say that I am there? And the disciples responded, hey, some say you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So the disciples are telling Jesus, ideas are just flying all over the place about who this Jesus of Nazareth guy really is. I mean, have you ever met one of those people, one of those people who just has to be the world's foremost expert on everything? Like whenever somebody's talking about something, they're like, no, 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 no. I'll tell you what the real deal is right there. If y'all are saying no, that means you've never met Raleigh before, okay? Because yeah. Raleigh is like that guy. Whenever somebody says something about something, there's just those people in your life who's like, oh, no, no, let me tell you what the real deal is here. And that's who these guys are encountering on their missions. They're going out to all these different places, and they're talking about Jesus, and then people are like stopping and saying, no, 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 no. Let me tell you who this Jesus guy really is. Let me tell you the real deal about who Jesus is. And so Jesus takes his disciples on this long walk to this specific place. Now, nothing in the Bible is ever mentioned by accident. It's not just kind of a throwaway detail. There is a reason why we hear that Jesus took his disciples to the region of Caesarea Philippi, to that spot where the explorer dude was standing just a second ago. So why this place? I want us to talk about the significance of this particular place where Jesus brought his disciples to ask them this eternity-shaking question. He brought them to Caesarea Philippi. And here's some of the things that we know about this place, Caesarea Philippi. It was called, it was originally called Panyas. Somebody say Panyas. It was originally called Panyas in honor of the pagan god Pan. Pagan, the pagan god Pan, he was like this, um, it, it, the pagan god Pan, it's where like the early church got the idea, the cartoonish idea of what the devil looks like. You know, like the caricature of this red character who has horns and a tail and a pitchfork and all that kind of his little beard and a you know, crooked nose and all that kind of stuff. That whole image of the devil, that came from the imaging of the pagan god Pan. Pan was this god of mischief who was supposed to live off in the forest. If you've ever heard of a Pan flute before, 
He was supposed to like play the flute to like enchant people and invite them into the forest so he could kill them and stuff, right? That's who the pagan god Pan was. And this whole city, this whole town that was built around the base of the Mount of Mount Hermon was was named for the god Pan. It was called Panyas. Well, then uh, later on, Herod, the the Jewish king that was there, Herod's son, his name was Philip, he renamed the city Caesarea Philippi after Caesar Tiberius and himself. So this guy, Philip, he was like both a suck-up and he was stuck-up, right? So he named the place Caesarea Philippi. I want to name it like half after Caesar and half after me because I want people to remember my name too. So he's naming it after Caesar to suck up to his boss, and he's naming it after Philippi after himself so that everybody remembers his name. That's why it got its name Caesarea Philippi. Well, Caesarea Philippi was ground zero for pagan worship during the time of of Jesus. Because so you can see on the picture that's up here, there's an artist rendering of what it looked like in Roman times under Roman authority. So you can see there's the base of that mountain where I was standing in that video a moment ago. At the bottom, you see at the top, that's what it looked like then. The picture at the bottom, that's a picture that I took when standing there. That's what it looks like now. This was this place was ground zero for pagan worship. So it was dedicated to the pagan god Pan, but there was a whole bunch of other statues of fake non-existent gods there as well. And everybody from that area, everybody, when they came to give honor and worship and praise to their pagan gods, they came to Caesarea Philippi. They came to Panyas. All right, which BT dubs, I'll tell you this. Actually, the, the city now, the city is called Banyas, like with a B. You know why that is? Somebody asked me why. You know why? Because in Hebrew, they don't pronounce the letter P. So <laughs> they just officially changed the name to Banyas because they can't say Panyas in Hebrew. All right, and whatever. That's free information for you. All right, so Jesus has brought these guys a long way. It's about 40 miles from Capernaum to get to Caesarea Philippi. When we were there last month, it took us about an hour to get from, we, we went from Capernaum to Caesarea Philippi, and just in the charter bus on the highways and stuff like that, it took us about an hour to get there. I Google mapped it earlier today. If you walk, if you're just like walking straight through, no rest or anything like that, it takes you right at 11 hours to go from Capernaum up to Caesarea Philippi. That is a long way for Jesus to take his disciples just to ask him a couple of questions. I mean, can you imagine Jesus and his disciples, they're walking everywhere that they go. And as they're along the way, they are several hours into this trip. And they're like, Jesus, I know you're wanting to ask questions. Can you just ask us right here? It's like, no, no, no. I'll ask you when we get there. When we get where? We got some further to go, right? And so for 11 hours or maybe even over the span of a couple of days, Jesus takes his disciples up there to that place, to that ominous, spooky-looking place that everybody knew, wait a minute, this is the headquarters of pagan worship here. Jesus, why are you taking us here to ask us these important questions that you've got? Think about that visual backdrop that Jesus has as he's asking this question, who do people say that I am and who do you say that I am? All of these shrines to these pagan gods. Now, I'll I'll tell you this too, guys. Having been there to Israel, anything that the Romans built, man, Romans knew how to build stuff, all right? The stuff that Romans built, it's like still there. You can even see in the side of that mountain there, you you can see the little uh, enclaves that are still etched out of the mountain right there. That, that, this, this one that's right here, this one that's slightly bigger, this baby, that's six feet tall and six feet deep right there. That was the, that was the spot where the, the idol for the pagan god Pan, he sat right there. Well, that baby is still etched in the mountain. You can still see the details right in there and stuff, right? They built stuff that lasts. All right, so why did Jesus take his disciples all the way there just to ask them these two questions? Who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Now, I get a sense that the disciples, uh, I, I get a sense that they were having a little bit of fun, <laughs> all right? They were, they were, they had like this afterglow, uh, you know, excitement about having been on these mission trips that Jesus sent them on, and they saw Jesus doing these miraculous things about demons going out before them, and people, sick people were healed, and, and uh, you know, people were, they were sharing the gospel, and people were giving their hearts and lives to God, and man, it was just this incredible stuff, so the disciples were in a good mood, and then Jesus asked them that first question, who do people say that I am? And then right at that point, 
conversational poker started taking place, right? Uh, and ladies, I, I don't accuse you of doing this, but fellas, I know every single one of you do this. Uh, y- y'all are all conversational poker guys, aren't you, right? Whenever somebody says something, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's going to be a huddle of guys that get together. As soon as this is over, they're going to start telling stories about something. And I'll tell you, it doesn't matter who says what, about what, and with whatever authority. There's going to be a guy in that group who responds to whatever somebody else s- says by saying, oh, that's nothing. I'm, let me tell you this, all right? Because guys, whenever, whenever, ladies, this is why you have trouble communicating with fellas. I'm going to tell you this. Because whenever a guy is hearing something, whenever, okay, whenever you're talking, I'm sorry to admit this, as a dude, the guy is not listening to you. I'm sorry. He's not listening to what you say. You know, he's watching your lips move and stuff, and he's kind of bobbing his head and stuff like that. But you know what the dude is doing while he's bobbing his head like this? He's just thinking about what he's going to say that's going to top whatever you said. That's what guys do. It's conversational poker. That's what we do. Somebody says something, and then the next guy's just got to beat that. I got to say something that's better. I got to say something that's better. I think that's what the disciples were doing right here in this spot. Because Jesus asked him, hey, y'all went to these places? Who did people say that I am? And there was one of the disciples that must have piped up and said, hey, there was this one guy. There was this one guy in Cana. He said that you were like... John the Baptist with his head stitched back on or something, man, <laughs> right? And then one of the others was like, no, 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 man, that's nothing. Let me tell you. When we, when I went over to Perea, and this guy said that you were like, Elijah, come back to life. Right? And then some of the others was like, oh, do do this. That's, man, you don't know that. That's, that's, that's nothing. We went over to the Decapolis, this area of 10 cities, and it was just like this battle that was taking place between people because everybody was just trying to figure out which prophet you are. Somebody said you were Jeremiah. Somebody else said, no, nah, he's Isaiah. Somebody else said, no, nah, he's Malachi. No, 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 he must be Micah. No, that's Amos come back to life, right? And they're just trying to decide which, which one of the Old Testament prophets Jesus is. You know what? In our day today, there are a lot of opinions about who Jesus is. And many of you have encountered those opinions as well. There, is a, there are opinions today that think Jesus was not really a historical person. There really was never anybody named Jesus who actually lived. I mean, yeah, that's, a, that's, that's like a name, but not like the Jesus who's written about in the Bible. That's not a real person. That there's, there's the opinion that people share that Jesus is this mythic hero who is, who is this combination of these other legendary heroes written about in other myths. And so they just combined the best aspects of all these different heroes into this one superhero Jesus, right? And there's people who kind of push that opinion that, no, nah, Jesus isn't real. Jesus is this mythical character. And there's other people who say, yeah, there was a Jesus who really existed in history, and he was a good man who was a great teacher, but he wasn't God. There's no such thing as God. So he was just a good guy, good teacher, too bad, died a tragic death. There's others who say, Jesus, he was a heretic. He was a blasphemer who claimed to be the Messiah, but he was lying. You know what? When I walked around in Israel last month, there are people who refer to Jesus as Yeshu, which that doesn't mean anything to you and me, right? It just sounds like they're not finishing the word. Like, well, yeah, shouldn't his name be Yeshua? Yeah, 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 that's his name. But there's a lot of Orthodox Jewish people who refer to Jesus as Yeshu, as a diss to Jesus. It's a term of disrespect because Yeshu in their, in, in the, um, in, in their language, in Aramaic, Yeshu is actually an acronym. It's an acronym that they attribute to Jesus and the acronym actually spells out, may his name and memory be blotted out. So there's a lot of people that whenever you talk to them about Jesus, they say, oh yeah, 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 I know, Yeshu? You're talking about Yeshu? And they're saying, yeah, that heretic who blasphemed and said he was God, May his name and his memory be blotted out. And that's why the reason that they refer to him as Yeshu. There's others whose opinion of Jesus is that he was a revolutionary leader who angered religious people and the Roman government, and he got executed for it, and he's still dead. There's other people. There's other people who have another opinion of Jesus. They think, Jesus, he is this super nice guy. He is this super nice guy who forgives me for everything that I do wrong because Jesus gets me. He gets me, right? And it doesn't matter what I do wrong. It doesn't matter if I'm going to do it again. Jesus just, he just loves me. He wants me to live my best life right now. And so Jesus just forgives everything because that's just it. Jesus is love, right? 
And we've got this idea of who Jesus is. Well, there's lots of opinions flying around about who Jesus is, just as certainly as when the disciples went to these different cities. That's why Jesus asked them, all right, you went there. Who do the people say I am? Some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're Elijah. Some think you're Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. And then Jesus turns the question back on them just as certainly as the question is turned back on you and me tonight. It's not a matter of what does everybody else say that Jesus is. The question comes back to you. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? And I don't know how long the disciples stood there in stunned silence when Jesus turned the question back on them. What about you? Who do you say that I am? But Simon Peter was the first one to speak up and to offer his response to that question. Let's take a look in Matthew 16, verse, verse 15 and 16. Jesus turned the back, question back on him. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now, guys and gals, I'll just tell you, I so identify with Peter for so, it, throughout the Bible. There's a lot of times when Peter said and did some boneheaded stuff, and he let his mouth like run off before him and got, got himself into trouble by saying things he shouldn't have said and stuff. But every once in a while, every once in a while, Simon Peter hit a home run. He, nailed, he hit the nail right on the head, and that's what he did right here. Because standing right there in front of that massive structure with shrines that were dedicated to all kinds of fake gods, amid all of these conversations with different opinions about who Jesus is, Simon Peter stood right there. But before, and before anybody, any other disciples stepped up to say anything, Peter says, look, I don't care that we're here in front of all these pagan idols. I don't care that everybody else in all these other towns say different things about who you are. I don't care that none of my other bros are speaking up right here. I'm here to tell you, you are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Simon Peter said something great. Jesus loved Simon Peter's response. And he told the disciples that this kind of faith this kind of faith in him is something that Jesus can build on. It's something that he can build on. That's what he said in verse 17 and 18. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. BT dubs, that's the last time ever this man was referred to as Simon. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are now Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Simon got him a new name. He got a name change right there at that moment. No longer was he known as Simon. He was known as Peter, which the name Peter means rock. But actually, Jesus used the word rock twice in this passage that we see right here. There are two different, and it, again, it doesn't translate to us in English just because we're English speakers and we have the same word for rock. We're like, hey, this is a rock, that's a rock. It's just rock. We got one term for it, right? But in Greek, it's different. The name Peter is the name Petros, which means rock. It means a detached stone, a whole lot like this one right here, a detached stone. So this rock is a smaller part of a bigger rock, right? That's what the word Petros is. BT dubs, this is a rock from Caesarea Philippi, right here. Stuffed this baby in my luggage, brought it home with me. I don't know if the international police are looking for me, but I brought a piece of Israel right back with me right here, all right? And so Jesus says, you are Petros, Peter. You are a detached stone that's part of a bigger rock. And then Jesus says, and on this rock, on this Petra, the word Petra means rock, but it means bedrock, the foundation stone, the one that, the, the, the big stone that like the mountain is made of and stuff. That is the Petra, all right? So Jesus uses that word twice. He said that he is building his church on the Petra, the solid rock foundation of the faith in him and him alone. Now, Jesus, Jesus did, wasn't saying, Peter himself was not the bedrock. He called Peter Petros. And then he said, you are part of the Petra, the big rock, right? So Peter himself was not the bedrock. Jesus, I mean, Jesus was going to build his church. The only reason I bring that up is because there are like billions upon billions of people who don't know what you just found out right there. And people who think that what Jesus was doing right there is Jesus was telling Peter personally, I am building 
my church on the rock of Peter himself. And there are billions and billions of people throughout history who think that Peter in that moment was named as the first pope. And that's who the pope is now. That they, There's billions of people on our planet who think there's this line of succession that Peter is like, he, Jesus actually gave him keys and said, hey, get these keys and you're the one who's going to be standing at the gate letting people into heaven or telling them no. That's not what this is, all right? That's a lie. There ain't no such thing as a pope. That's not a thing. The keys that Jesus was talking about giving Peter is the key to the message of the gospel that Peter just spoke. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God and Jesus said, yes, that's it. You are a detached rock. You've tapped into what is the big rock that is the truth of this gospel, that this can set people free. He says, that is the key. So that's the key to sharing the gospel with people. That's the key to setting people free. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Peter used these keys. We're getting, we see it just as the narrative goes on. Peter used that key of the gospel in Acts chapter 2 when he shared with Jewish people about Jesus as the Messiah, and there was 3,000 people who got saved and baptized right there on the spot. A couple of chapters later, Peter was the first one to go to a Gentile named Cornelius and share the gospel with his family, and he, it was the key to sharing the good news of the gospel. Cornelius and his family came to know Jesus, and in that moment, people of Jewish heritage and people of Gentile heritage, it became known that they can be part of the same spiritual family and they can be brothers and sisters in Christ. That is the key. Guys and gals, I'll tell you this. The church of Jesus Christ is built on the foundation of the message of the gospel. Jesus said, on this rock, on this Petra, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Why did Jesus come with his disciples 40 miles to tell them this? Because Jesus is standing right there. I, when I took that picture right there, I'm standing in the exact spot where Jesus stood when he said this. That gaping hole that you see right there, that's what the entire pagan world at the time, they actually physically referred to it as the gates of Hades, the gates of hell. That is the doorway to the realm of the dead. If you would have asked people 2,000 years ago, where do people go when they die? They would have said, right there. That's where people go when they die. They go into the realm of the dead, and they go into that cave right there, which is usually filled up with water. It was just kind of a low season when we were there. They go right there, and they, that is the gates of Hades right there. So Jesus took them all the way to this spot to stand on that spot and say, on this rock of the gospel, I will build my church and the gates of Hades. As he stand, the gates of Hades are right there. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The realm of the dead will not prevail against the gospel because Jesus has come to give life and give it to the full. There is eternal life that is only available through Jesus. So standing on this very spot, Jesus declared for everybody to hear, the truth of the gospel is the power upon which God is going to build his church and the gates of Hades, the power of death will not prevail against it. Have you become a rock? <laughs> Have you become a Petras? Your name doesn't have to be Peter. What I'm saying, are you, are you attached to the truth of the gospel? Has there, has there come a time when you've accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, the one who stood right there at the gates of hell and proclaimed the gates of hell will not overcome the power of the gospel because in him was life and that life was the light of all people. So guys and gals, I tell you, when I went on that trip last month, this was like one of the more powerful experiences that I had because I'm standing there in the exact spot where Jesus proclaimed in front of all of these fake gods and everybody else, the gospel is the solid rock foundation on which you got to build your life. Have you built your life on Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Let's go. God, we praise you for your power 
over sin, over death, over the forces of evil, over fake gods. Lord, we praise you that Jesus is the rock of ages and that you have given us the invitation to be a piece of that rock, to be hewn out of that rock, which death can never overcome. So God, as we look over these next couple of weeks on what it looks like to build our lives on you, God, would you show us clearly what it looks like to build our lives on the solid foundation of the rock of ages. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.